Well, hello, I'm so glad to be here with Marty and Rachel Amos. Uh, over the last year, they have seen some massive transformation in their marriage, and I'd love it if you guys would just share kind of where, what was life like between the two of you a year ago? It was pretty horrible. I was, one particular night, I remember laying in my bed in a dark room. I didn't want to talk to anybody, didn't want to talk to him especially. Um, I just felt hopeless. I was reaching out to God, reading my Bible, praying, and just feeling hopeless and that there was no way to restore the trust between us. And so I reached out to get some resources to help us that Marty would relate to and that he would respond to well so that we could hopefully repair the relationship. So it sounds like you, one of the things that you did is you brought it into the light, that you weren't going to stay in the dark place anymore. No. What was it for you, Marty? What was the thing that you noticed in that year? What's been the transformation and just that trust level between the two? Realizing and learning how I needed to communicate with her and understand how she was feeling about things and lack of communication or words spoken to her, how they were affecting and hurting her knowing that I needed to say more than three word sentences to help her understand things. That can be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And three words is a lot. You'd rather just give the head nod, right? For sure. <laughs> so when you're talking about like trust that's been fractured in that process when the two of you were working through that, is there something, Rachel, that for you, there was a moment where you said, okay, now we can move towards each other and where trust can be rebuilt? Yes, I can remember the Easter service where we did communion and um, there were post-it notes on the table and we had been trying to make changes, but we were really relying on old habits during that time and they st it just wasn't working. And so I wrote on a post-it note, broken marriage, and went and put it on the cross and I left it there and I left it with God and I didn't take it back as I walked away. And so it just really opened the door for me to be able to have him speak into our lives and make new habits moving forward. So the transition becomes no longer holding on to the brokenness, but saying, I'm going to move towards restoration. Yes. That's so powerful. Thank you, Marty. So how do you recover from something like that? When your marriage is fractured, when your heart is fractured, when everything seems to be broken, uh, one of the things that we've, an observation we've made about brokenness is that it usually comes in two forms. One form is that it comes because of something someone else has done to you, the abuse or the words that were spoken, that heartbreak that comes. And the other reason that we are broken is because of the choices that we make, the foolish thing that we chose to do, the, the website we went to, the alcohol. There are choices that we've made, the horrible decisions that we've made that leads us into these broken places. And as we process this today, we're going to look at what does it mean to be broken because of what I've done. I remember as a seven-year-old, uh, we were uh, riding to the church for a potluck. And uh, when we got out, I'm pretty sure it was me that dropped it, but I dropped all the food onto the ground. And I remember my mom crying. My mom didn't cry often. And my mom didn't cry because the food was spilled. My mom cried because the platter it was on was the one that she had received at her wedding. And it was in a million pieces, and it would never be restored. When we talk about brokenness, I want you to see it from this perspective. The idea of the vocab here is that it no longer functions as originally intended. Every piece of that platter was laying there, but it would never be restored. It doesn't matter how much duct tape or super glue you put into it, it will never be restored to its original intent. What does it look like to be different from a platter? See, the interesting thing is platters can't be restored, but people can. And this is what we want to look at today. So the guy we're going to be looking at, his name is Peter. He's also known as Simon. So if you ever hear Jesus referring to Simon, it's often Peter as well. So those two names are synonymous. We were prepping for this and I had a friend praying for me and he was praying that God's word would be moved in people's hearts. And as he was praying that right before I was preaching, I thought to myself, man, that's a really good prayer. If I was supposed to stand up here and talk with you about healing out of brokenness, it would last about four minutes. And in those four minutes, it would waste all four minutes. There would be absolutely no value for you whatsoever because I have nothing to offer. But man, when you can look at brokenness and the healing that comes from Jesus Christ, it's amazing the transformation that can come. So we're gonna be in uh, John chapter 21 and we're gonna look at the life of Peter. And here's one of the things I want you to see a heartbeat behind this is that failure isn't fatal. 
You may have blown it. You may have destroyed things. You may have wrecked your life, but God is still God and God is still good. It may feel like you have killed everything off, but failure doesn't have to be fatal. A little background for you on Peter. Uh, Peter. Peter is the Barney Fife of the Bible. I was just thinking about this. Barney Fife is all bravado and can't back anything up. If you're Barney Fife, you start with whenever you think you got it all, you start with that sniff. And then you don't do anything about it because he's a weakling. And you're interesting about Peter. Peter is all about bravado, but every time he's fishing, and he's a professional fisherman, in the Bible, every time, he doesn't catch anything. Have you ever... Notice that. In the story we're looking at today, Peter makes his biggest boast and his biggest failure. It's the day before Jesus is going to die, and in that bravado of Barney Fife, he says it doesn't matter what anyone else does, Jesus, I would die with you and for you. I'm with you. I think in his mind, his confidence was going to reassure Jesus, hey, dude, it's going to be okay. I'm here. The Son of God really needed to hear that from old Barney And in the process, Jesus looks at him and says, hey, hey, let me tell you the truth, man. I'll tell you the truth. This comes from uh, Matthew 26. I tell you, uh, truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if, this is where you, 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 you boast in your confidence, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Let's take it to the biggest extreme. If it means my death, I'm with you. And all the others said the same. And Jesus says, well, you may think that. And here's an interesting thing. This is the, the final night when all of the disciples are together. And as they're processing the night, after this, they, they sing a hymn. And then they head out into the night. And Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John. And they go to a garden where Jesus is going to pray. Now, this is just hours after the bravado, the Barney Fife moment. Then they get to the prayer time. And, and Jesus leaves Peter, James, and John. He says, stay here and pray. Watch and pray. This is a really big deal. And Jesus goes off and says, God, remember the plan that whole plan where I die, it's a bad plan. Let's do something different. He says, but not what I want, what you want. And then he goes back. Now remember, if I have to die for you, Peter, he goes back and he says, Simon, Peter, what are you doing? You can't watch and pray he had fallen asleep. I'd give my life for you. I won't stay awake for you, but I'd give my life for you. You can't even make it through the night. Jesus goes back and prays again. And then a second time, Jesus comes to him and says, Simon, seriously, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch? You see, even if is the bravado. And Jesus responds, couldn't you keep watch for an hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The Spirit's willing. Oh, you can talk. Your your heart may even say it's true. But your flesh is weak. And at that very moment, Judas, one of the 12, who was about to... Uh, sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, shows up with a detachment to arrest Jesus. It's the middle of the night. You're not allowed to do that. It's against the law. But Judas and a detachment of soldiers are going to arrest Jesus. Peter, in, the, in that moment of saying, I'll jump in and I'll save you, Jesus, he grabs a sword and he tries to attack. And in the process, he's got bad aim. Instead of cutting the guy's head off, he cuts his ear off and Jesus says, stop, put the sword away. You live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. And then Jesus picks up the ear puts it back on and heals the man. The man who's coming to arrest him and they head out for the trial. And as they get to the courtyard, Peter and John follow at a distance, but they're in the same courtyard. And during the trial, there's a young girl that shows up and she looks at Peter and she gives a second look. I know you. You're you're with Jesus. You're with the guy on trial. And Peter says what all eight-year-olds say when they get in trouble. "Uh Uh-uh. No, no, uh. No, I didn't. No, no. And a little bit later, another guy comes up and says, I know you. You're with Jesus. I've seen you before. And then in response, finally, an hour later, and this is what it says, about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is from, he's a Galilean. He could tell by the accent. Um, the Galileans were from the north. Jesus was from the north. So was uh, Peter. And he says, Look, listen to the accent. It would be like if someone from North Dakota or from Georgia were here. There's a, there's a distinct accent on how they, they verbalize things. He said, this, this guy's got to be with him. And listen to the response. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Now listen carefully. You're about to see the last interaction with Peter and Jesus while Jesus is still alive. At that moment, remember they're in the same courtyard. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. There's no word spoken, just eye contact. 
Remember now, don't you? And at that very moment, Peter remembered the words that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows, today you will disown me three times. How do you handle a moment like that? How do you handle the time when you look at the relationship and it's fractured, it's broken, it's not coming back together? Let me tell you the American way, or at least the American church way. The goal in the American church is, is if you're ever broken or you're ever fractured, your goal is to make yourself restored to the original intent. Remember, brokenness is no longer usable. This is how it looks here. Before, if this, by the way, if this is your car, sorry about using your photo, the idea is that your car is smashed. This is what you want. That when people see it, there's no evidence of anything wrong because you put it back together and it looks perfect on the outside too. I think that's the church way of handling brokenness. But I want to tell you about another way to handle brokenness. And it comes from Japan. There was a shogun in the 15th century. He had a favorite tea bowl and it's probably his kid knocked it over. That's what happens at our house. Knocks it over and it cracks and it breaks and he wants it restored. It will no longer serve its as its original intent, much like my mom's platter. And he says, something's got to be done. And so they send it off across the seas to people that they think might be able to fit it, fix it and put it back together. They send it back and someone tried to staple it back together. That's worse than crazy glue and duct tape. Are you with me? Staples on porcelain. They, he brings it back and he's disturbed. It looks worse than it did when he sent it off. So he talks with his people and he says, can you do something? Can, you, can we come up with some glue that would work for this? And in the process, they came up with one of the most beautiful forms of art. It's called kintsugi. And the idea is that they take glue that's laced with gold. And instead of saying, hide it, don't let the fracture show, don't let the broken places be seen. No, the broken places become the places of beauty. And that's exactly how Jesus works in us. In fact, it's where the gold is, is where you see grace. You don't see any gold unless there's something broken. I think the same thing is true in how we relate with the places in us where we're broken because of what we've done or because of what other people have done. It's there that Jesus shines through. And I want us to look at brokenness differently. Remember the idea is that don't let anyone know that you're broken. I want us to blow that idea up. I had a friend who went to a men's retreat, and at the men's retreat, there was one of those special moments where the, where the Holy Spirit started working on people's hearts, and a man stand, stood up and he said, I want to be honest with you. I have an addiction, and I need healing. With transparency, he stood up and he said to the crowd, I'm broken. And another man stood up and said, me too, I have that same addiction. Another man, and another man. And there, in the middle of that, a church was transformed from an American institution into the holy, special place of God, where brokenness was going to see Jesus moved in it. And then an old man who wasn't comfortable with this type of grace stood up and said, shame on you. And that movement of the Holy Spirit to say, I'm broken, was covered up. Because the goal is not to reveal you're broken. The goal is to look good. And there are shattered grace. Make sure you're just covered up. And the first thing I want to challenge you to in this is I want to challenge you. You have to know you're broken. And if you're going to live hidden, if you're going to live unwilling to say, this is where I'm broken, one, you'll never find healing. And number two, You'll never let the grace of Jesus, that gold will never shine through. If you've ever had a five-year-old fall out of a tree and break his leg, you know that there's a really brutal part to that. It's so when you take him to the doctor, you've already suffered through that there's a fracture in the leg and he's already cried, but he goes to the doctor. Now, what is the goal of the doctor? To make him feel better? No, no, it's not. And if you think the goal of your brokenness is to feel better, you will turn to alcohol, you will turn to drugs, you will turn to sex, you will turn to anything but Jesus, because feeling better is not the goal. The goal is to heal the leg, which means with all the brutality that doctors have sometimes, they have to take the leg and set the bone. And oftentimes it's more painful to be healed than it is to be broken. And you can ignore it. You'll just walk with a limp the rest of your life. You can kind of heal. And here's what I want to challenge you to today. Some of you have been broken for years and you think because it doesn't hurt anymore that you've been healed. That's not healing. That's just not hurting. And that's not the same thing. And my challenge for everyone here is to admit you're broken. And in the process, you'd be willing to lay down on the bed and let the wonderful, beautiful doctor of Jesus Christ 
set the leg. And it's in the middle of that that that's where you will find grace. That's where you find the gold. That's where you find it all transformed. So picture this for Peter. Peter knows he's broken. One of the gifts that Peter has is that his breaking was public. There's no hiding it. There's no secret here. Everyone knew. And after it happened, after that eye contact with Jesus, it says that he went outside and he wept bitterly. I don't know if you've thought this through, but since the mo- his last interaction with Jesus until Jesus rises from the dead, his thinking is that the Son of God, the one that it was, his rabbi, his leader, and his hope, was dead and it was over. But more than that, it ended with a broken relationship. And how do we, that does he move forward in that? Well, Jesus rises from the dead on Sunday morning. And in the process, there are two or three women that have met Jesus and they are sent back to, say, to tell the people, to tell the disciples that Jesus is alive. But there's an interesting phrasing that they use there. It says, go back and tell the disciples and Peter that the, that the Lord is risen. I don't know how Peter felt. My guess is he felt like he's no longer part of it. Well, he denied him three times. He disowned him. What relationship could Peter have with Jesus Christ now? But he says, hey, go tell him. And then later on, later that day, Jesus shows up in the room. But I don't know how this feels for Peter. You're looking at the Son of God risen from the dead. There's all of the excitement, but there's also like, I know there's something between us. And then Jesus leaves. He shows up again later, about a week later. And this time he has some words with one of them. But it's not Peter, it's Thomas. Because Thomas didn't believe. Doesn't say anything to Peter. But the third time they meet up, there's a conversation. And this is where we pick it up in John 21. Peter and six of the other disciples decide, hey, you know, the only thing I know how to do is go fishing. Apparently not well, because they go out again and guess how many they catch. Zero. So they haven't caught anything. There's this great moment where Jesus is standing on the shore and he yells out, friends, have you caught anything? And then this is before fishermen started lying. That must have come in like the 14th century, but there's... Yeah, um, haven't you caught anything? Have you ever asked your husband, have you caught anything? I gave it to some bums along the way. Yeah, it's 28 feet. Yeah, 900 pound fish, gave it away. But they answer honestly, they say no. And then Jesus says one of the silliest things ever, if you've ever been fishing with nets, put your nets on the right side of the boat. If you're fly fishing, you, you hear that the guide will say, okay, you see that bubbling spot right there? You want to hit your, land your fly right at the top of that and let it drift down. These guys are fishing with nets in a lake. You put the net in on the right side or the left side, it's all the water underneath. Oh, there's the fish. They put it on the right side. 153 fish are breaking the nets and they go to pull it in. And while they're pulling it in, John looks over and says, Pete, Pete, it's Jesus. And Pete looks up, pulls his outer robe, tucks it in, and he dives in. You've got to love Barney Fife. Full bore, and he swims in, and, he's, and now he's standing face to face with Jesus. And Jesus says, bring some fish that you have caught. So Simon went and grabbed all of the, the whole thing and pulls it up. And, and he says, come and have breakfast. Jesus already had some hot coals, and there was some bed, bread being baked, and uh, there was also some fish, and he sits down with them. And when they had finished eating, this is in verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? There's an implied thing that he says here when he says, do you love me? He's implying, I love you. Do you love me more than anything else? Do you love me more than these? Am I valuable to you? And Peter's response, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, well, feed my lambs. And then he said again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Exact same words. He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And a third time, verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, this time, this is the third time he's asked. And if you continue to ask, it implies that something is wrong. There's something broken. And this thing that Peter is so afraid of when he hears Jesus say, do you love me? Implying that Jesus loves him. It implies that there's some healing that's happening right now. And yet he continues to ask. I think there's some parallel here that, No, I don't know the man. No, I've never heard of him. Man, get out of my face. I don't know him. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? But Peter's hurt. And it says there in, uh, in verse 17, Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus says, feed my sheep. One of the things I find so fascinating about the way that Jesus processes this with him 
Instead, he processes it, processes it by not looking at the denial, but looking at the heart connection between. He moves into love. He doesn't even bring up what, what Peter has done. So one of the things that you have to know, first, once you know that you're broken, then you can allow for the grace to move in. You have to know you're loved. And if you're wondering if you're loved, and I know that some of you in the room are, because you never felt love from your parents, and after the fourth husband left, you haven't felt loved, and there's now a problem between you and your kids, and you don't know that you're loved. Here's one person that I know in all of eternity that loves you. It's Jesus Christ. Because though we were still sinners, Christ died for us. One of the things I think that happens out of this is that Peter changes his identity. For the last three to four days, he has been thinking, my identity is I'm the one who denied Jesus. Did you know that the symbol for, for Peter is a rooster? A testament to all of Christianity for the rest of time that a rooster represents his biggest failure. I wonder if his identity was tied to that. I love Ephesians 1 because it says, well, when Jesus Christ has transformed your life, it changes everything. Ephesians 1 says that I'm holy. It says that I'm blameless. It says that I'm adopted, that I'm chosen, that I'm sealed until the day of redemption. Essentially, this is who I am. I'm the one that Jesus loves. Now, you may be too, but I know that I'm the one that Jesus loves. Rachel told a little part of that story uh, where she essentially heard Jesus say this, do you love me? And it related to the idea that she had had all of these heartbreaks and this fracture in their relationship. She told a little part of a story. When we, at, when we were getting ready for Easter, Paul and I were discussing how we should do communion as we were doing the Lord's Supper as a sermon. And we decided instead of doing it on video, each campus did it live at their own place. We kind of created our own special moments. And uh, so uh, we had six stations for communion. And at each station, we did the bread first. And then we went back. And then we prayed together. We talked a little bit more about the blood. And then we, we, we did the, um, the juice and representation of the blood. And then we went back and we prayed. And then we talked about how if Jesus Christ can carry all of our sins on the cross. Can he also carry our heartbreak, our burden? Can he carry the broken places? And then while the, the band played a song, everyone could go to one of the stations and there were little post-it notes. And you could write down what was breaking your heart. And she wrote down, she even said the word broken marriage. And then she walked over to the cross and hung it there. And she said that that was the moment. It's, it reminds me of Peter on the shore, that moment where there's the love connection. Yes, Yes, I love you. You know that I love you. Let me ask you this fundamental question. Do you know you're loved? Well, interesting response is every time Peter said, yes, you know that I love you, Jesus' response is very interesting. He says, feed my lambs, care for my sheep, and feed my sheep. Each time, which is kind of a symbol. They lived in an agrarian economy where the idea of leadership was a shepherd. When he said sheep and lambs, he was referring to people that were followers of Jesus. But an interesting little thing, that in the midst of love, he didn't say, do you love me? Yes, you know I love you. Good, now we're back together. He then gave him a purpose. And this isn't necessarily how everyone heals, but I think a key component for most of us is that there is an aspect of purpose involved in healing. So number one, do you know you're broken? Do you know you're loved? And finally, do you know your purpose? I was thinking of Marty who spoke on this. I was talking with some of his friends. We were in a circle last week and I said, hey, Marty's on the screen next week. And they went, what are you talking about? Uh, Marty uh, has a, an allotment of about 45 words per day that he uses. Marty's not a big talker. And yet here he is on a screen and not just on a screen, but sharing his brokenness. There is a purpose that God is using in his life that in the midst of the broken, he's saying, look at the cracks in me. And then in the process, you can't help but look at the cracks and say, look at the gold. Look what Jesus is doing. Purpose is a huge part of this. Now, there's an interesting thing um, that Jesus says. He says, feed my lambs, care for my sheep, and care for my sheep. Why does he have two distinct differences between them? And I, I want to just rest on this for a second on the idea of feed my lambs. I, I know that some of you uh, grew up in cities. And so let me clarify. A lamb is a baby sheep, Okay. <laughs> I almost said a baby goat because I was raised in a city, but they tell me that a baby lamb, a, a, a lamb is a baby sheep. And here's what I, I want you to hear in this. I think that when, when, when Peter is hearing some of the purpose behind it, he's also expressing value. Uh, there's two ways to look at this idea of lambs. It's either a baby Christian or a child, and I think it hits on both. And so for some of you, I want to challenge you that when you see someone who is new to Christ— is that someone that you're caring for? And the idea of feeding meant that you were going to share with him what God had done in your life, that what God has said in his word, that the Bible will be taught to those who are 
new to Christ. And the second one is just how do you respond to children? And what I mean by this, are you the guy or girl that is the old man, get off my lawn? Because every neighborhood has one. Get off my lawn. Hey, well, when you see kids, you see nuisance. Let me challenge you. That here he, Peter is at a moment of deep breaking and the first inkling that Jesus, or the first thing that Jesus says to him is to point out, feed my lambs, those who are new to Christ and those who are children. Are, when you're around your grandchildren, are they a nuisance? When you're around your kids, are they something that you put up with? And maybe you're okay with your kids, but not other people's kids. When you see them, do you see that Jesus loved them? And I, just going back earlier, um, when Peter and, and Jesus were in that three years of process, at one point, the disciples, probably, my guess, is being led by Peter, were saying, stop bringing kids to Jesus. He's too important. And Jesus says, knock it off. The heart of the, of the, of the gospel is, is wrapped up here. Heaven is for such as these. Bring them on. Bring the kids in. And I would challenge that. The idea, sometimes it's easy to, to push them off and to not care for them. But I think that God has a heart for kids. God has a heart for children. Where's the place that you put in that? And if you're a father or a mother, what role are you playing in making sure that your kids know Jesus? You know, a great habit to create in your home is that every night when we're going to bed, we end the day with the Bible or we begin the day with the Bible. Is the Bible part of your relationship with your kids? After he says, uh, feed my lambs, he moves on to say, uh, take care of my sheep. And I've been doing some really deep research. I wanted to know what does this word care mean? In English, okay, care. But as you dig deeper into the Greek, you find out, you know what care means? A little bit more clarity for you. It means care. It means exactly that. It means when you see people, you care about them and you care for them. I want you to evaluate your life. If, to, if today you died, how different would the care of those in your family and in your life be? Would they feel the weight of loss because you were no longer there? Or are you, they would be sad that you were gone, but would they be heartbroken because you are someone who lives out care for other people? In the last two years, I felt um, a wonderful grace that God's put in my life. Uh, I, he has brought in someone who has pastors me in a special way. Um, Zach Newman, who is our group's director, has been one of the great additions for our team as far as life groups. But for me personally, he's the guy that when my heart is broken and when my life feels like it's a wreck, he's the guy that is constantly saying, hey, are you doing okay? And if Zach were gone, I would feel the loss because he lives this out of care. I remember my father, first time I ever heard the story, my father was on stage and he got choked up and he was talking about his father-in-law, Glenn, now, Glenn had a rough end of his life. He was on Iwo Jima, and he had, they gave him shock treatment. It really messed with his head. He ended up with Parkinson's, and then at one point, he dropped his cigarette, and he burned his entire front of his body, and his esophagus was closing up because of the cancer. He had a rough go. But I remember my father standing on stage weeping because he felt the loss of care when Glenn died because every morning and every night, Glenn prayed for my dad. I actually have my grandfather's Bible. He died when I was not quite two years old. I never met him in any capacity. But you know what's interesting? My name is written in his Bible because every morning and every night he prayed because he cared for people. And is your life about you or is it about a purpose beyond you? If you are broken and you lay in the hospital bed, every muscle you have will atrophy. Get up and get back in the game. And the second challenge for you out of this and the idea of feeding is not just feeding your kids the word of God, not just feeding those who are new to Christ, but for some of you, it's time to stop just going to a life group and it's time to step in and start leading. It's time to move beyond consuming and saying, where in the, in the course of our church, in the course of our community, in the course of our neighborhood, is it different because God has called me and given me a purpose? Such a key component for where we're going. And I see that it just played out in, in Marty, that, that beautiful picture of a man with few words using words to express his brokenness to say, here's what's wrong with me. As we looked at the, the story of Marty and Rachel, we dealt with the idea of their marriage being fractured. But oftentimes, you can deal with surface cracks. But unless you cut deep, and open up and look deep into the organs of our heart, deep into our soul, you often will miss what's really going on. And Rachel had something else happening, something deeper that was broken. And as uh, she stepped forward to say, here's what's really true 
about me, the grace of God shone more brightly than I could have ever imagined. To help you understand a little bit more of Rachel's story, watch this. Anytime that we have to process through our brokenness and our heartbreak, um, sometimes there's a deeper fracture in our hearts that has to be dealt with. And Rachel, you went through something over the last couple years where you found some healing from something that's been deep in your past. Do you want to share how that happened? So I saw a flyer for a ministry here at Family Church called Surrendering the Secret. Um, I didn't know what it was. It didn't have a lot of detail on the flyer, but I suspected that it was for me. And so I signed up for it and it's a Bible study on surrendering from abortion. And it was a really powerful Bible study, powerful ministry in my life. Um, it led me to probably the darkest place in my life and then the brightest place in my life. Tell me about that process. So as you're going through the Bible study, you learn a lot about yourself. Um, it's not just about the act of an abortion, it's about what it means to you and how it impacts your life. And there was a moment where I started thinking about my children and I love my children so much, they're so precious to me and I had to finally admit to myself that I had another child and I killed that child by my own choices. And I was in a pretty deep despair. Um, very depressed, would come home and all I could do is lay in my bed and cry. And I didn't know how to come out of it. I didn't, didn't know that there was a good spot on the other side. And all I could do was pray and ask people to pray for me. What was that like for you, Marty, just being, trying to be a support and a love for her in the midst of it? It was a very helpless feeling trying to comfort her and not knowing or feeling like I was able to help her out she was in. So as you're in the middle of that though, I know you don't stay there. No. So tell me about that that process where that study takes you to the depths and then the finding of healing once you've surrendered that secret. So there was one of the homework assignments called At the Foot of the Cross and you were supposed to picture yourself at the foot of the cross with Jesus and just write whatever words came to your heart and it was just like a flood of pictures and words and emotions that came to me and realizing that Jesus isn't removed from me he is right here I'm at his feet anytime I want to be I am right at his feet so it's not just knowing he's there for me in the good it's knowing that he already knows my sin and there is no sin that's unforgivable and I just pictured him taking that sin from me, me pulling away from the chains, not hammering the nail any longer into his feet, and him absorbing that sin and freeing me, breaking me from those chains. And I was able to accept forgiveness from him at that point. And I know I have a child in heaven waiting for me, and there's gonna be a joyous reunion when we get there. What I'm hearing you say is that the, is the restoration came, there was a healing that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't walked through the brokenness. Absolutely not. It would never have been as powerful. I didn't realize how broken I was until I completely broke mm -hmm. so that I could completely heal. Completely broken so we could completely heal. We want to allow for a moment for you to let the Holy Spirit maybe do some work pointing out maybe you are so hidden what's broken in you that you can't even see it. For some of you, you are, your heart is bubbling up because you are so broken and you know it. So what we're gonna do is the prayer corner will be open and Susan and Darlene and Pastor Paul will be over there if you want someone to pray with you through some of your brokenness or if you just wanna sit, uh, Craig's gonna sing a song, just allow for a moment to let God speak to you. Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure Great. 
thank you for grace. I thank you for the gold places in our lives where our brokenness reveals our need for you. God, I pray for those in the room who right now are wrestling with that deep hidden secret and the idea of telling their spouse or their idea of sharing with someone what happened and who they are, who they really are. I pray that you would give them the courage, the courage to let you put them back together. Thank you, thank you, thank you for grace. In your name we pray, amen. We want to give you two of probably the hardest challenges that we've ever given. The first one is we want you to admit that you're broken. We're hoping to redefine fine, to look deep and say, what is broken in me? And only when we admit the brokenness can we accept the love in those places. And maybe even harder, the second thing we want to challenge you to is to share some, with someone else your brokenness, where the conversation finally happens. And I'm going to speak specifically to marriage. For some of you in the room, your spouse doesn't know, and it's time to tell the truth. And I want you to know something, that when you admit the brokenness, it may really be tough in your marriage for a while, but I want you to know this that the grace of Jesus is more than enough. And more than that, we would love to be a part of walking this through with you. Family Church is here. We love to support you. We love to help you with the gold part. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say, we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks. <laughs>